Hi everyone, welcome to this edition of Lackawanna County Arts and Culture Live, a show featuring our local artists, musicians, and history and heritage experts, sponsored by the Lackawanna County Arts and Culture Department. We have a very eclectic show for you tonight. We're gonna to start out with Jeff Chapini, who's going to be actually playing an instrument from Northern India, the sitar, followed by visual artist Constance Denchini, who's going to be talking about and showing us some of her artwork that's been inspired by the faith and heritage in Lackawanna County. And then we're gonna end with the duo featuring Don Cannon, who's been a wonderful long-term musician and played in a lot of fun bands. So welcome, and without further ado, uh, let's bring on Jeff. Well, welcome Jeff to Lafona County Arts and Culture Live. We're thrilled to have you. Uh, you've been a musician on the scene for a long time, playing a lot of different styles of music, and we see you out and about on the art scene. Uh, and one of my first questions to you is uh, what I'm really struck about um, your mu musical path is that you have you play a lot of different instruments and you play a lot of different styles. Um, you started out punk metal and then you play jazz and now what you call your softer side, uh, you are exploring Indian classical music. So what a great range. And I'm wondering if you can uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, do these different types of music blend together? What inspires you to explore new instruments? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, Indian music was actually before I, uh, I came from, like, punk and metal, you know, just playing guitar in high school and whatnot, and, uh, in bands and, what, and stuff, but, uh, but then, I, I, I moved out to, like, different instruments, like, you know, like, mandolin and banjo and accordion and stuff, saxophone whatever and then um but like I didn't I didn't really know anything and but uh, I stumbled across a sitar one day <laughs> and, uh, and then like it's not so much about the instrument but the music in North the Indian classical music North Indian classical music and, uh, it uh it's just the whole world you know and so I took like five six years yeah practicing every day for 10 hours or more, you know? like just you know it's a lot of reading a lot of listening a lot of like because i mean you know it's a whole different world but then eventually i was like uh i learned that Type of theory. <laughs> Let me learn Western theory and jazz. But oh, you really to put yourself on. into it. Like you were yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. No, I I try to play as traditionally as I can without a teacher and all that. You know what I mean? But uh, I also keep it casual. You know. <laughs> I know. Now, does it connect to your early days? You know, punk and metal is, is also quite a. It powerful. really does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. I always really wanted to uh, kind of like show those punk and metal people that like <laughs> this this is cool, you know, <laughs> and like kind of make it accessible in that regard. That's nice. It's a good word. And, and it I, is classical music. It's very, very awesome. <laughs> well, sometimes I think people. We had another guest on who was doing. Uh, he played the clarinet and the oboe, and, and again, that's sometimes a people That was so it. cool. Yeah, he was great, and I think, I was saying, like, a lot of people I don't love that. For them. Yeah, but I think when people hear it, it music does touch us, because you said, you know, you mentioned it's not about the style, it's about the music, and I think that's such an important point, um, that it, it really is the music that can move us in many genres. Like, a lot of people may not think they like punk and metal, but when you listen to it, it's very powerful and dramatic and definitely emotional. So I think that's one of the things we like about the show is that we can expose people to music they haven't heard. So before we turn it over to you, can you tell us a little bit about what the sitar is so people who may not be familiar with that instrument? It's a it's a pluck string instrument, <laughs> and it's made of a giant gourd. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting fact alone. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, it's, there's kind of an artistry with the instrument too. So that's the. Yeah. I, mean, I can see why it's difficult though. There's a lot. There's going a lot on. more to it, obviously. But, yeah. 
Well, I don't want to, I think the best way to learn is, is experiential. So we're looking forward to hear you play. So I am going to turn it over to you and I will pop back in to thank you and say goodbye. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff here. Thank you.
you, Jeff, for, for sharing the beautiful Indian classical music and maybe exposing it to people who were not familiar with it. It, it was great. And uh, if anybody wants to learn more about the sitar or other Indi Northern Indian classical music, is there somewhere they can reach you or find out about it? I just have my Facebook. It's uh, G Francis Chia. No. E -E. <laughs> okay, good to know. Um, so yeah, we encourage our, our viewers, if you really enjoyed that, to, mm -hmm. to see to seek Jeff out and support artists. So yeah, you know, if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Anything, um, yeah. And we want to thank you uh, and uh, have a good night and thanks for joining us. And now we're going to bring on visual artist uh, Constance Denji. <laughs> well, welcome Constance. I'm thrilled to have you on this show because you've been a long-term artist and friend who's done amazing work in our community and various uh, art formats for lack of a better word so it's great to talk to you and also see a project uh, as you mentioned that maybe you don't get to showcase as much so um, I'm not going to ask you too much about that because I know you're going to be that's your presentation which I'm really looking forward to on faith and heritage which I think is just a lovely blend of art and history and heritage of this area so so I can't wait to see that and I think our viewers will really appreciate it but before we get into that just you know, like I said, we've worked together in a lot of capacities. You're very supportive of the arts in Lackawanna County. What has what your journey as an artist been? And t tell us about the different mediums that you do work in. Wow. Um, <laughs> Good question, but <laughs> just a little taste. Yeah. This, this August, I'll be 55. So uh, actually, the house that I'm in was my grandmother's house. And at the age of five, in this house, in this room, <laughs> I declared with one of my little crayon drawings that I was going to be an artist. <laughs> mm -hmm. What a great, that's awesome. So you and knew- My grandmother framed the, the work and she hung it on the wall over there. And uh, my family has always supported that. They've just, I- I can't remember a time when I wasn't making art. Mm. So, you know, my journey began like, <laughs> before I can really remember, I was just making stuff and I could see that it made people really, really happy. Mm. And um, then I start, you know, as you get older, then you get more skills and more knowledge about your art form. Mm -hmm. And then you become very introspective. You're not trying to please the outside. You're trying to please yourself. You know, you give yourself challenges. So uh, I had a wonderful art teacher in um, high school, Mr. Merrill. And mm. he called me his ace. He had four aces. And I was one of the four aces. Maybe I was the ace of hearts. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But uh, I wanted, my parents wanted me to be like a political science major or maybe a teacher or something like that. And Mr. Merrill, because uh, I won like the Scholastic Awards and all, like all those kinds of things. And, um, you know, he called my father and said, I've been teaching a long time in this, you know, a a child, a, you know, a young person as gifted as your daughter only comes around once, you know, well. That's great. So you had an early, you had an early supporter. And I, th I think that's so important for people to believe in other people. And, th and that sent you on a great path. And I know you ended up, yeah. That's why it, community based arts are so important because he told my father, that my skill set was so strong, but that I couldn't get the figure drawing skills that I needed in the school because of, um, you know, they don't allow new drawing, people to draw nudes. So he sent me to a museum school and a local art and community center. And there I, you know, met a, my figure drawing teacher who was a professor over at Colgate. And I was, I had to have a waiver signed because I was only 14 yeah. or, no, 15 years old. I was 15 years right. old. Let's jump. And everyone was like, wow, look at her <laughs> draw. And, um, you know, and that's how I, I was still not confident 
believe it or not, I was still not confident in my skills and if I wanted to be an artist. So when I became a... Oh, no, I just wanted to jump back to that point about the community arts, because I think that's a good segue into what you're talking about, because community is so important and telling that story of the community involving people, and you've always been an advocate for that. So, so um, thank you. That, that has been something that, a seed that was planted in me without my knowledge because, and I will say it was because um, of the places that I lived. I was a military brat and I lived a lot of, in a lot of places and on military bases, they always have a art center or a hobby center that to keep people involved, like the children involved in the arts. But then when I was in the civilian world, we had an art and community center. So then I saw how my art connected to the community hmm. and the community connected to me. Aww. And there's like ebb and flow that if that never happened, I couldn't be the artist that I am. I am, I always consider myself a community based artist, even though I'm a trained fine artist, I consider myself a community based artist. And I think what, you know, slam that out how do they say baseball far out was when I was at the University of the Arts. Lily Ye was one of the professors it in my department. Art speakers, yeah. Well, yes. I think that's a good segue. Yeah, that was so great when you met Lily. That was a touching moment we, when we bring in the, the national speakers, but to have a connection to a local artist who's just blossomed. But I don't want to take too much time away from your presentation because it, it's so you. <laughs> no, no, that's okay, Constance. You have a fascinating story. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll have you back. No, I think everything you said was really important for people to remember. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you and then I'll pop back in to thank you. And, and, and uh, I'm really looking forward forward to this. So I'm going to spotlight you and then uh, can't wait to hear it. Okay. Okay. So I, I graduated, we got up to the point where I was at the University of the Arts and I graduated. And um, then I actually went back to my hometown and um, I got a job at a prison teaching English. <laughs> as a long-term substitute. And that actually accidentally landed me up in a position where I was at that art and community center where I took my first figure drawing classes, um, te you know, teaching programs, like a, trying to create like a halfway program for kids transitioning and out of the, uh, facility. So then I landed up getting a job there as an education uh, coordinator and everything just kind of took off. Like my work with the community was feeding my work with um, my personal work, my personal artwork. So what I consider my academic work. So then I, um, I met my husband and I married him and we moved. <laughs> he was in the military and we moved a lot. But one of the places we lived was in Delaware and we started a multicultural project um, in the art community there at the Dover Art League. And then my husband had orders to Japan. So I went to Japan and when I was in Japan, um, I was completely immersed in a different culture. Utashi wa gaijin desu. Totomo chugao desu. I was a foreigner and it was so different. So then when I came back to America, um, I came back to America for 10 months with my husband in Mississippi. And then he retired and we were supposed to come up here to Northeastern Pennsylvania for three months. And that was in um, October of 2004. But on that third month, um, my mother unexpectedly died. And then five 
weeks later, my husband had a massive stroke. So he didn't die, but um, when he came out of his coma and everything, our marriage didn't survive the aftermath of all of that. So I was a stranger in northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, I still had a very thick accent from Japan, people tell me. I I personally think that I always talk the same. But it was during that time where I started to connect with my extended family. And one of those extended family members was Alan Sweeney, who was a local um, historian. And he is my relative on a, the, the Welsh side of my family, my mother's side of the family. And um, he, he loved history. And so many members of that side of the extended family love history, love history. So him and I would have these long, meandering mind walks about history. And then he said, hey, cuz, I'm going to put you on the ambassador tour. So he put me on the ambassador tour, and he gave me a video that he was in called Stories of the Minds. Or, so um, I watched that. I went on the tour, the McDay tour, and I was just pinging, pinging, ping, 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 ping. After that period of time where you know, my, that I was thrust into singledom and trying to figure out everything with my grief. Um, <laughs> Alan put me, he knew how to ignite me. My cousin knew how to ignite me and to kind of reground me because grief, um, as America's experiencing right now, grief is a, a, mal a maelstrom of emotions. But it was um, during that time, oh, and I had the, my pamphlet right here. Hold on one minute, I dropped it. <laughs> he told me about his faith and heritage tour in Oliphant, and we had extended family in Oliphant, and still do have extended family in Oliphant. The Welsh Baptist Church was there in Oliphant. So I read this, and um, the part that uh, was really interesting to me was how the immigrants from different places had different faiths and how the community evolved the way it did. And the one thing I noticed when I first moved here is that it was very provincial. People would hear my accent and they would say, uh, are you from here? And I'd say, no. And they'd say, uh, where are you from? And I said, well, I, you know, I, I lived in Japan and I was in Mississippi. And I would say, are you from here? And let's say I was in Jessup and they'd say, oh no, I'm from Peckville. And I, <laughs> and this was kind of funny to me, you know, because when I <laughs> generally say, are you from here? That means like the area, but people took it, you know, very literally. They're not from Jessup, they're from Packbell or they're from Oliphant. So I saw this, like the, like fingers on a hand, you know, Packbell, Jessup, Scranton, Clark Summit, um, to me, they were all one place, and I had to learn. I still mix some of them up, but um, it was through Alan's Faith and Heritage uh, pamphlet, I started to connect the dot as to why that happened, why that occurred, and um, I came up with the idea of for the children of anthracite legacies we're all children of anthracite legacies. And it also always bothered me that there were always these monuments to the grown men, the miners. And I knew that my grandfathers and my uncles had all um, 
gone into the mines when they were 10 years old, when they were like in fourth grade, about 10 years old, they went into the mines. And there are no monuments in Northeastern Pennsylvania for the children. And I actually talked to Marianne at the uh, Lackawanna Historical Society, and she said they didn't even really record their deaths. They recorded the deaths of the men, but they did not record the deaths of the children. And this uh, bothered me. So I started working on this Children of Anthracite Legacies. And um, I was doing it kind of as a community, communal base. I saw that the community is predominantly Catholic. So I came, would always come up with these community projects. And somewhere along that line, I started seeing all the icons. I had, this is around 2009, and I had only ever known icons as an academic study. Um, but when I did the um, Coal plus Amber, the Children of Anthracite Legacies plus Amber, because I have Amber roots, I am, um, I'm of Lithuanian heritage on my father's side. And actually my cousin Alan introduced me to someone and some people know me through the extraordinary journey, which was filmed in this house, which I called the house Cole built. The children of anthracite legacies built this home. Um, so while I was grieving, Cole became a symbol to me. I I had left one whole lifestyle for this very new one in a new world. Everything here was new to me. The accent, jee, uh, batten all, two, three, uh, up the line, down the line. These were all new words in my vocabulary. And I got to know the people and their stories, like when they found out what happened with my mom, many people knew my mom, um, when they found out what happened with my uh, husband, they would share their stories. And, um, I, and it was sometime during this time period that my cousin Alan died. And then, uh, you know, at the funeral, um, Father Sika, who recently passed away from COVID-19. No, I don't know that. <laughs> he, he, when we were first locked down, it was scary. He, Father Sika, died. And I have all of his books, and he was a great comfort on that journey. And it was the support of the faith and heritage in this county that actually got me to explore the icon. Somebody came to my show, a, a, a woman just came to my show, the Amber and Cole show, and said, oh, you have to go to St. George's on Kaiser Ave. It's Orthodox Church. There's a streaming icon. You have to get anointed. You have to get anointed. So we kept hearing this. So I went and I saw the streaming icon and I got anointed. And um, then I kept going. I was like, I was just going there all the time. And um, that is when I made the commitment around 2012 or 13 to explore the spiritual side of icons. And I did study briefly the written icon. And I want to make clear that my icons are not written, they're painted icons, even though I do fast and pray and meditate. But these, icons are connected to the children of anthracite legacies because faith and heritage is like one thing in this community it's all one we're all children of anthracite legacies <laughs> that have this very diverse um faith and heritage, there's Orthodox, there's Baptists, there's Methodists, there's Catholics, there's Muslims, there's uh, Jews, there's 
um, people of Hindu faith. I've met so many different faiths. But I live in Jessup, and they have a community festival every May. We didn't this year because of the COVID-19. But um, that is what the guiding saint for Jessup is Sant Nubaldo. That's why I have him hanging up. I still have a few details on all of these paintings to work. And then this is the mother of God that I painted and it's holding, Saint, the infant Christ is holding the relic of Sant Ubaldo. And then the infant Christ of Prague with the sacred heart of um, Mary was actually inspired by a window that I saw during a mass at a Saint Ubaldo that will actually turned out to be the last Saint Ubaldo mass in St. Mary's. And there was a window and I was inspired by the window and other things in the church to create that painting. So a lot of those paintings inspire me to do the performance work I do. This is kind of like the behind the scenes paintings. I do the, I rarely show them. I remember one time when I went to uh, the mass at St. George's, Father Mark said, the mother of God is not a rock star. She's to be honored. So I'm always hesitant about how and where I show her because one thing I know about Northeastern Pennsylvania is that the devotion people have to um, God, Jesus, the mother of God and all of the saints is real. And there is nothing I would ever want to do to disrespect any of the people practicing those faiths. So um, I consider these works my devotionals. I work on them at home. People rarely see them. And then in the public, I'm doing my community projects. I'm doing my children of anthracite legacies. And uh, here, it all, well, in 2007, all in, to get myself through um, my grief. This is Amber and Cole. And then I wanted to show, these are, I'm sorry guys, I'm so new to Zoom. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to show you. But these are new designs that I made. Originally I started with uh, wrap designs, like this one. This is an older design that I made, and this is one of the newer ones where there's a setting that there's no longer a, a wrap. So the story behind the coal is also tied to faith, heritage, and community. So in my art, if people follow my art, oh, see, here's a little, um, the little tributes to um the children that have no memorial so many of us in northeastern pennsylvania either had one of these children that was a grandfather or uncle a father a cousin that labored in these mines um these are some of mine and I did not mean to pun, <laughs> but their stories. Now remember during all of this, when I was creating all of these, um, their, their stories are what got me through my grief. And I like mixing the coal with pearls because pearls come from a grain of sand that's uh, irritation and from an irritant comes such great beauty so for me it's a metaphor 
the other thing too is that pearls um, are here's another one with this is a new design but pearls like coal and like amber here's the amber piece coal like amber and pearls are naturally made they're they're not rocks amber was once sap um let me see if we, amber was once sap and uh whoops sorry guys amber was once sap coal was once grass and pearls were once a grain of sand that became an irritant in a oyster so when I mix the coal, I'm always trying to think of like their interrelationships. And the necklaces are always inspired by the art, which is inspired by the people who inspire me. So the coal, the children of anthracite legacies, who still walk on the ceilings of that legacy every day, inspire me. And um, it inspired me to start in 2013. I don't know how to work this. This is a painting that I just, I'm still working on her. Um, let me see. But what you can't see, the black all around her, that soot. This was a transition painting where I started mixing. Um, actual soot into my painting she's like 95 percent done but um the cool i'm not sure if i'm explaining it well but so many people see me in the community projects and they've heard me talk about the children of anthracite legacy the coal becomes those each individual people become a metaphor and this is the tangible symbol for all of us children of anthracite legacies this is the tangible symbol it's a reminder to all of us about our faith and our heritage and those immigrants that alan wrote about that came here we walk on the ceiling of that legacy every day and in my darkest times when i had lost my way and lost sight of myself i actually was in this house the furnace went out i went downstairs and i was upset and i kicked my wall kicked my foot back and coal fell out and when that coal fell out i picked it up and i just thought to myself um i i of my mother my mother no matter where we traveled in the world my mother always had a piece of coal and if we misbehaved she'd be like don't you ever forget who you are don't you ever forget who you are so I was like, I'm coal? I'm coal. And I just thought of Superman squishing that diamond from the coal. He used so much pressure to make it a diamond. And then it became a metaphor in all of my work, not just this series, but all of the other um, community-based series I do that we are the diamonds without pressure. When we get pressure, we shine. That's the legacy that our ancestors passed down to us. So, so when you get down, when you get down and you hit bumps in life, so when I was doing my artist residencies with the NEIU in the schools, I told the children, remember, you're coal. Oh, I like that. You're a diamond that can shine under pressure. 
And right now in the United States, we're all under a lot of pressure. So I hope that you all fuel yourselves with your own coal power. What a beautiful, what a beautiful message to carry with us, Constance. Thank you. I love the whole story of connecting it back to our ancestors here, being proud of where we come from, seeing the faith and the community development, and also the reminder that we can get through challenges as both a country and a region. So I think that was a beautiful message that, um, so we really, I really want to thank you. Um, I certainly learned about a lot about your journey, but also, you know, the, a reminder of the great history and heritage of our, our area. So um, where can people find you if they want to see more of your artwork? You have a great Instagram page and a, a Facebook page, correct? Yeah. The Instagram and um, on my Instagram, you'll see the diversity of my work. I I just find, you know, I'm old and I I've been doing this a long time. So I post pictures of art from all over. My Instagram is I Constance E Y E C O N S T A T C O N S T A N C E I Constance. Right. On Facebook, I am I space Constance unseen U N S C E E N E. Well, thank so I Constance unseen. Yeah, and I, I, Maureen, I I did want to add that you know it's not just what I learned because I was a military brat and I always moved was. Um, that you can't get through your darkest days without your community. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I went to a test pattern to read a poem, that before I had even made the necklace, you had written a poem. Ah, oh, I remember that. You, read it, you said you carried a piece of coal. You yeah. were out in California, I believe it was, and you had a piece of coal. What a and nice I thought, story. Yeah, I remember. I actually remember that reading. That's, I think, where I met you and heard you. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. And Test Pattern, of course, was managed by my brother, the original version, for years. And I think it was a great space. And now we're lucky, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll, and it's a difficult time, but hopefully we'll return with arts, cultures, and all the great stuff happening in downtown Scranton. But uh we wish you well with your artwork and again, look forward to seeing more and um, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Um, again, if our viewers- I feel like I've rambled too much. <laughs> that's what this is for. This program is to showcase our artists, learn more about them, and then hopefully go and view their art um, in, the, in the world. So make sure to check out Constance's Instagram and Facebook page. And um, now we're gonna say goodbye to Constance and bring on our last performers of the evening, Don, a Don Cannon duo, um, who I'm looking forward to. So thanks again, Constance. Uh, we'll see you hopefully again soon. All right, thank you, Maureen. Well, last but not least, I'm really excited to get to sit down with Don Cannon and jo Joe Santos, who have had a, a long, I said, illustrious career in Northeastern Pennsylvania. So welcome, so glad to have you both here. Um, the new duo for you guys, which we're going to talk about a little bit before, before your performance. But um, first, let's go back a little. I mean, it is impressive about the, the types of bands you've been in and the styles that, that, ha that you've done and experienced over the years. Can you tell us a little bit, both of you, about your history uh, being a musician in Northeastern PA? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I started playing out back in the mid-90s. Um, which feels like a hundred years ago now. And um, actually, Joe's band, Jug Dish, was one of the one of the bands I favored when I first started getting into the bars. And you know, I turned twenty one, and he was already playing. And um, uh, Jug Dish was always very impressive to me. And uh, you know, to actually get to the chance to play with him a little bit is is kind of been interesting for me. You know, just being in this in the business, we never really knew each other before, but I think we both both know of each other. And um, we met under sports circumstances, and uh, you know, we just kind of we we're both looking to do something, and that's kind of how how this worked out. Yeah. Um, and how how would you say you 
either one of you can answer have evolved over the years because I know you've played in different types of bands and you know you've brought a lot of humor and different styles to, to you know you're great performers so um, have you had an evolution as personal musicians? I, I have I, I used to be a, a rhythm guitarist in all, all the bands I played in and um, playing acoustic and you know doing solo and duo work it, it forced me to learn more chords and just be a better musician still not a very good musician but <laughs> it forced me to improve at least and um you know what one of the nice things about starting out with somebody new is you know you get his musical tendencies and you know the, the kind of stuff he likes to listen to and likes to play and then you'll see that today but like most of the songs we'll do today i've never played before and i, I never even heard them before so it was it was a nice point of enlightenment for me. I don't know about Joe, like how do you how do you think? Well, it's different to play. I, when I quit uh, playing years ago, my son was born is when I decided to quit. So I had stopped playing for ten years. So I haven't really done. I, mean, I do I do stuff here and there, um, but nothing. I didn't go to a different band. I didn't try. I played in Jugdish for fourteen years, and the guys I played with, I played with for most of my life when I was a kid. Um, but, you know, I just kind of stopped doing it for a while. And then it got to a point where, you know, the kids get a little older. They don't really need you around as much. And, uh, you know, we kind of just stumbled upon each other. So it just kind of happened. You know? For our viewers who might not be aware of Jugdish, uh, can you tell us a little bit about about that band? And uh, Well, we started uh, in the 90s. Uh, it was, you know, a bunch of friends that I had for a long time, uh, the guitar player. Uh, Joey Gleski is known in the area still. He, 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 you know, works at Sound Investments and stuff. And, uh, you know, Clifford, uh, the guy we're lucky enough to sit at his studio today, um, I played with him initially, and we played in a band all together. It just kind of, once I was in Jugdish through the 90s, that's all we really, you know, we played quite often in the, again, like in the local area, we used to run into, you know, these guys all the time, but we just never really, you know, never really knew each other, knew each other, but now we're kind of getting to know each other, so. Yeah, it was always so busy. I mean, my when I was in Who's Your Daddy, that was my first real band, I would say. Um, you know, we was we would play 150 shows a year in our busiest time. Um, so we were in bars when we were playing. It was hard to go see a band like yeah. you know, like theirs because you know they were we were always playing at the same time. So those rare nights off is you know if, if you went to see a band, you, that meant you respected that band because you know you have one night off a month maybe in a, on a weekend. So. Yeah, good point. So now you guys are, this is a new project. Um, I know you were saying you're still trying to figure out a name. Maybe you can give us a little hint, but but what's your hopes now for this this new duo, this phase of your careers? Well, I, I, I think um, we just both love to play. And I, I think there's, you know, there's enough of uh, places to go to see certain types of acts. Um, I, I think we want to bring something that might be a little different, a little more mellow. Um, the songs that, you know, we kind of like versus, you know, the, the typical club type songs, you know. Um, again, I, I, I alluded to it earlier, you know, Joe introduced me to a couple artists I never even heard of. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting to me, like, the, where this will go, because, you know, I, I'm kind of taking the lead from him at this point. I, you know, I have my set of songs that I've been playing for many years. And, um, you know, he has his, so we're kind of trying to mingle those together. I don't, you know, I don't see us playing an awful lot. No. Um, it's, just, it's just more like to kind of just keep that, that interest in, in music, to, you know, together. I, I yeah. love that creative process of blending different uh, experiences and interests in music together. You, you get a kind of a new, a new product isn't the right word, but, but a new creative, um, Vision, I guess. Yeah, I would say a vision. Yeah, so, um, and how do you pick a band name? Like, how, what is that process like, or a duo name? Is that difficult? You know, uh, some of the best band names are, are the most ridiculous ones that have no association to anything. Um, we, you know, I, <laughs> I had said we, we should call ourselves, you know, Sir Tanley Bald, because, you know, we're certainly bald. Um, that was one of the ideas I had. And then, um, you know, a combination of, of a couple of the bands that we've been in. Um, Jug of Jack kind of came up from my, my uh, membership in Fake Uncle Jack and, and obviously Jug Dish. So I think that's where we're leaning right now is, is Jug of Jack. 
Okay. Well, keep us posted. Where can, can is there somewhere people can find you if they if they want to follow you or, or how can we? Um, not yet. That's, not yet. It's okay. that new. <laughs> well, you know, through our county arts and culture page, when you're up and running, let us know and we'll promote it. But in the meantime, we're really looking forward to to hearing you play. And thanks for joining us on Lackawanna County Arts um, and Culture Live. We appreciate Lackawanna County uh, reaching out to the, the uh, musicians in the area and uh, trying to, you know, trying to give them an opportunity. We, uh, we're very appreciative. Well, and thanks for having us, for sure. My whole Saturday Sunday too I was thinking about the ways not to lose I laid down my weapon is what I've done too late to hide feet too soft to run but people say I'm the luckiest man Yeah, they say Running is useless Fighting is foolish You're not gonna win But still you're the luckiest man You're up against Too many horses And mysterious forces Watch your darn always You are the luckiest man You're the luckiest man Don't talk to the devil when he calls my name. But sometimes when I'm losing, it all seems the same. And when I fall back up again, just to slip on the same mistakes and slide right back in, people say I'm the luckiest man. They say a running is useless, a fighting is foolish. You're not gonna win, but still, you're the luckiest man you're up against. The too many horses and mysterious forces. Well, why should Don know where you are the luckiest man? You're the luckiest. Try to keep my faith, keep my mind I hate to lose either one when the whip cracks behind And I can't help but moan just a little each night People say everything is gonna be alright But people say I'm the luckiest man They say running is useless, and fighting is foolish. You're not gonna win, but still, you're the luckiest man you're up against. Too many horses and mysterious forces. Watch your dawn always, you are the luckiest man, and you're the luckiest. Man, you're the luckiest man Cool beans Yeah, we are the Jugger Jack Welcome to Lackawanna County Culture and Arts Do a little Big Head Todd and the Monsters Big Head Don Monster. Monster. Monster's on. All right.
can't turn back the time of the cold tears from your eyes you the pangs of wounded prize you hold me did someone do you wrong yet yeah. got love as good as gone maybe you ain't as strong as you want to be it's all right if you don't want to go home it's all right if you don't want to be alone it's all right if you don't want to go home i understand i understand i understand Nothing stays if it's gotta go, yeah You can't get a water from a stone now But sometimes you gotta think about the things you're gonna love You can't point the finger at him You can say something for a sin now But somehow it never was, never was good enough It's alright if you don't want to go home it's all right if you don't want to be alone it's all right if you don't want to go home i understand i understand i understand when the morning comes and you put yourself together Face another day When the day ain't gonna change you forever You come walking my way Sure, love you, dear you're doing all right you're pretty much out of sight i don't hear you knocking around my door anymore i'm glad to hear you're doing well i know the time will tell only when you're broken down is that what friends are for it's all right if you just want Go home, it's all right if you just want to be alone. It's all right if you just want to go home. I understand, I understand, I understand. Especially at night I worry over situations I know it'll be alright Perhaps it's just your imagination Day after day Me appear Night after night My hobby Shows the fear Ghosts appear back another day alone between the sheets it 
only brings exasperation It's time to walk the streets Smell the desperation At least there's pretty lights Though there's little variation It nullifies the night From overkill Day after day reappears Night after night my hobby shows the fear Most appear and fade away Come back another day so okay. bad. Thing I ever had 
in a world gone mad A lady you're so bad So this guy, this guy's called John Moreland, and I would have sworn this is Bruce Springsteen the first time I heard the song. It definitely has that quality. All right. So it's called Love Is Not An Answer. What do you say, Joe? Oh, I sound like I'm out of tune. We tune because we care. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Hold on. So we're going to be... Uh, flopping around once the uh, the pandemic is over. Please come and look for us. You'll see us at most of the old uh, the old joints. Um, Jug of Jack will be on Facebook shortly. And make sure you uh, also go out and patronize all the uh, artists that you saw here. And I'd like to thank Mario McGuigan for getting us in. Um, also, Cliff here, our sound engineer, is doing a hell of a job for us. We want to thank him as well. Rec room, the rec room. The rec room. Rec room. All right. There's a truth I need to trust. I can't remember how. I'm stuck here in the stillness and the noise is too damn loud And I thought I was an actor I let my colors show What if I'm just a bastard Laying low inside your stereo Won't you help me make a fist And choke the poison back we'll Close our eyes Each guy is sick in time And the world gets painted black And we'll wonder how the pain goes How the pain cuts to the pride and the tools we use to fix ourselves Are just the fools we stood beside But now love is not an answer Oh, I don't need an answer I need you And strong to tender Devotion dark and cold Devotion like an anchor Swinging from my soul Then I used to weigh the distance I used to miss my cue I used to say I love you 
wonder who I'm talking to But now love is not an answer Oh, I don't need an answer I need you I need you So bring me all your questions And bring me all your doubts Don't let me meet the devil That I song those songs about Cause the hounds of youth are fading You're all I gotta trust Your heaven's lonely ghettos Up there crying down on us But now love is not an answer Oh, I don't need an answer I need you Yeah, now love is not an answer Oh, I don't need an answer Yeah, I don't need an answer I need No matter what, I sweat. Oh, I sweat. I met you in the dawn. you in the dark you lit me up you made me feel as though I was enough we danced the night away we drank too much I held your hair back when you were throwing up then you smiled over your shoulder for a minute I was stone cold sober I pulled you closer to my chest Asked for me to stay over I said I already told you I think that you should get some rest I knew I loved you then But you never know Cause I played it cool when I was Scared of letting go I know I needed you But I never showed If I want to stay with you until we're gray and you know, old Say you won't let go Say you won't let go I'll wake you up with some coffee in bed I'll bring you breakfast with a kiss on your head I'll take the kids to school Wave them goodbye and I thank my lucky stars for that night When you looked over your shoulder For a minute I forgot that I'm older I want to dance with you right now And you looked as beautiful as ever I swear that every day you get better You make me feel this way somehow I'm so in love with you I hope you know Darling, your love is more The worth is waiting go We've come so far, my dear Look how we've grown I want to stay with you Until we're gray and old Say you won't let go Say you won't let go I want to live with you even when we're ghosts Cause you were always
always there for me when I needed you the most. And I'm gonna love you too. My lungs give out. I promise to death we part, like in our vows. So I wrote this song for you. Everybody knows that it's just you and me until we're gray and old. Say you won't let go. Say you won't let go. You say. James Arthur. James. All right. Who will be here? We on the first on this one. I hate to keep asking. Yes. All right. What the fudge? Man, man, my tuner. and all of them. All right.
All right, folks, we have two more songs for you tonight. Again, I hope you're enjoying yourselves. We're definitely enjoying this, our first time together. Thanks again to Maureen and Cliff and Lackawanna Culture and Arts. And Joe's tuner. My tuner? Jeez, I just keep sounding like I'm out of tune. I don't know if it's me. What's the wood? What's the wood? Friday night, I'm going nowhere. All the lights are changing, reach red. Turning over to the station, situations running through my head. Looking back for time, you know it's clear that I've been blind, I've been a fool. Open up my heart to all that jealousy, that bitterness, that ridicule. For Saturday, I'm running wild, all the lies are changing red to green. Moving through the crowd, I'm pushing chemicals, all rushing through my bloodstream. So clear, I've been afraid. I'll show you how I really feel. Get to some of those bad mistakes I made. If you want it, come and get it. Crying out loud. I love that I. one this one's for my dad he's always love when we uh, <clears throat> when we do some village all so we'll do that for him very dry 
very squeaky. Very yeah. squeaky. Me too. Me too. <clears throat> My fingers are squeaky too. <laughs> Everybody, have a safe night. Hope to see you all soon. Wow, I'm just always so inspired by the diversity of the art that people are practicing and showcasing in Lackawanna County. 
We hope you enjoyed the show and that you can join us for another Lackawanna County Arts and Culture Live. I'm Maureen McGuigan, Deputy Director of Arts and Culture for Lackawanna County. Until then, stay safe, healthy, and creative.